Pan Pan Psychast. Part three, mere instruments. So in this installment, we're going to be looking at the use of non-human animals in the contemporary world. We know there are issues which are equally as morally important on an individual level, such as hunting and trapping in the fur industry, and whether or not to have companion animals, rodeos and zoos. We'll talk about lots of those fringe cases or less pressing cases in next week's installment and further analysis. But in this week's, we're going to be looking at two key issues. They are animal experimentation and farming. Before we get into them, I think we should give perhaps a trigger warning for listeners. Yeah, so in case you are living under some kind of rock <laughs> and you don't know what animal Which experimentation... Which is fine if you're an animal living under a rock, this show... Yeah, if you're like some kind of slug or something, then existed. well done. Well done for listening to us, however you are. Um, but anyway, yeah, so a warning that we're going to be discussing some pretty vivid uh, examples of animal experimentation, which is going to be pretty horrendous, just mm. to give you a warning. And if you don't know anything about the conditions of factory farms, then certainly don't Google image it. But we're going to give you your, uh, again, we're going to be, I think with this topic, it's very important that we are honest and that we reflect the research that we've done and we don't sugarcoat it or sanitize it. I think even if you're talking to young people and children about this, it's very important that we are honest with ourselves and with other people mm. about where our food comes from and where a lot of the products that we may consume the history of experimentation that's led to them so to do the topic justice and to do the animals that have died in the process of those things justice i think it is worth saying yes we are not going to sugarcoat anything certainly that you've put that really really well concept better myself i think on the point of the images i think if i genuinely showed some of the footage to students if you showed footage to students in a high school you might very well lose your job it's, yeah, some of it it's is pretty graphic it's yeah. obviously horrific and but as singer writes in his book and a lot of the examples we're going to be using are from peter singer's animal liberation highly recommended links on the website as well as singer puts it it's not possible for us to talk about things like nazi concentration camp doctors and who they consider to be subhuman without stirring people's emotions when we're talking about huge injustices or what singer and course guard considered to be huge injustices and what we think we'll give in further analysis we have to give the actual examples for me this is something where before coming into this episode i had largely been on on this side of the fence of saying that i'm pro animal testing with certain things and, and it's largely because when you look at the evidence of certain conditions that have been helped because of the process of animal testing that has taken part in medical science is that you almost can't deny how many lives have improved because of that so here are just some of the conditions in which there have been advances in the treatment towards because of animal testing so things like uh, brain injuries breast cancer leukemia cystic fibrosis tuberculosis as well as things like um, diabetes and not to mention, I don't know how much of it relied on animals, but things like penicillin as well. It is undoubtable that many human lives have benefited from animal testing. So I think that's why a lot of people have an instant reaction to when somebody says, well, animal testing is completely wrong, mm. because they will say, well, without that, my, my, my son or my daughter, or my loved one, whoever it might be, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Yeah. And so that, I think that's probably worth prefacing this entire discussion on. Yeah, I think that's a good point to raise from from the get go. And I think as we explore this issue more, we're going to question whether or not animal testing is necessary to the discoveries that have been made. And as we mentioned in last week's instalment, Peter Singer's main point is that suffering of each creature counts just as much. Doesn't matter what creature you are, pain is pain, pleasure is pleasure. So if you're happy to inflict pain on another creature for your scientific discoveries, then you should equally be prepared to inflict pain on human beings and that's the charge of speciesism if you think that what's morally valuable is pain or pleasure now there are going to be fringe cases and there's going to be some difficult cases for the utilitarian to deal with uh, and the kantian I, as well i imagine but what we're going to pick out here for a start is we're going to make the general point as singer does that a significant proportion of these don't seem to be fringe cases, or at least they seem obvious to Singer and to others that you wouldn't inflict 
that same suffering onto human beings in the cases of these experiments. So again, just a last trigger warning here. We're going to be looking at some quite emotionally charged experiments here. So take this one from 1987. It's uh, Project X. Unfortunately, it's not the exciting party that goes wild. It's much more grim. It's the experiment that took place at the Brooks Air Force Base in Texas, in which lots of monkeys, I think a thousand in total, are strapped mm. into chairs mm-hmm. and they're taught how to fly like a, a, a plane simulation. Mm. And they're taught by having a lever in front of them, a little joystick. And what happens is like the screen goes upside down. And so then the chairs move at the same time and they get electrocuted until they move the joystick to like stabilize the flight again. And they get electrocuted like a hundred times a day and it keeps going on, keeps going on. And then once they've learned to fly, quote unquote fly, they then start exposing them to radiation and chemical warfare agents Mm. to see at what point the monkey is unable to fly. And the idea being that when we go into battle, at what point is the pilot going to not be able to control it. Skimming over the details and the obsessing points there, but hopefully if you when you look at Singer's book and you see the pictures and he explains that in detail, you really get a sense of how horrible this must have been for these for these creatures. Now, an interesting part from it is Dr. Donald Barnes, who did several years as the principal investigator at the US Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine, he estimates that he irradiated around a thousand monkeys uh, and he wrote after several years of conducting the studies, quote, one day the blinkers slipped off. I tried to point out that given nucleus confrontation, it is highly unlikely that operational commanders will go to charts and figures from rhesus monkeys. His colleague replied to him that they don't know the data will be based on animal studies. And then after several years of doing it, he resigns and he's a big proponent of animal rights. Take another one in 1973. 200 beagles were going to be used by the US Air Force. Their vocal cords were tied so you wouldn't be able to hear them barking just to test the poisonous gas, just to test which one's the most effective, uh, how many uh, can, how much of a dose can, can kill large groups. The complaints to the Department of Defense said it was the greatest for any single event they've ever had, surpassing the mail from the bombings of North Vietnam and Cambodia. The public outrage was absolutely huge. Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, yeah, just anecdotally there, I think I swear I read a, an article that was saying that there was more outrage on that experiment than there was when the US Army <laughs> detonated a nuclear bomb next to their own soldiers, <laughs> which is uh, shows you kind of the, the different public perception, I guess, of those um, different experiments, if you want to call them that. But that, yeah, that's quite fascinating, isn't it? How the beagles get people's hearts yeah. pulsing a bit, but actually the actual American soldiers that were irradiated less so. He's skeptical as the principal investigator that people will actually use this data. He's been doing it for several years. So the idea that one would inflict all of this suffering without thinking beforehand very, very carefully, if we're going to kill a thousand monkeys, we better be pretty sure this is going to be used and be useful. But as we'll see with loads of these studies, they just don't do that. Probably the most famous one we'll look at is Professor Harry Harlow's monkey experiments in 1965. Now, this experiment begins by raising monkeys from birth onwards in bare wire cages. And these monkeys suffer maternal deprivation. They raise the monkeys from a few hours after birth until they're three, six or 12 months of age in a stainless steel chamber. So this monkey spends several years of its life in total in the end, just in this isolation. It never has an interaction with anything. Uh, maybe has, it has its food like to live through the door and it cowers away when it comes in. And when you read that account, like, was it just me when you read that? It was so harrowing to think of this poor, innocent creature just completely isolated from absolutely anything and um, how horrible that must have, have been for it. So these studies, quote, found sufficiently severe and enduring early isolation reduces these animals to a social emotional level in which the primary social responsiveness is fear. I mean, I, I didn't do the study but i think we all knew that before right it was gonna it was gonna happen and john bowlby who visits harlow's laboratory um he conducted a, a similar study in 1951 but with humans he just asked harlow like, why are you doing this to monkeys he and his report i'll quote from his report he found with humans it leaves no room for doubt regarding the general proposition that the prolonged deprivation of the young child of maternal care may have grave and far-reaching consequences on the whole of his future life. Harlow continues even after this by trying to make like monster mothers to see to what extent will child monkeys still seek maternal care even if the quote unquote caregiver is unresponsive. So they have like a, a fake doll which blows it off with like air and the monkey keeps going. 
back up. The mother's then rocking back and forward violently, so the baby rattles off. Uh, some injects them, we injected with a spring, some have hard spikes that pop out. And they're still not happy because the baby's still going up to the mother. Mm. So eventually they raise monster mothers in these isolation chambers, then give them to the, the child monkeys. And what they found, sure enough, is that the, the mothers crush the baby skulls with their teeth. They slam the baby skulls against the ground until they die. And it's like, what were they expecting, right? And over 250 experiments of this kind were conducted between then when those started and when Singer writes his book in the 80s. And about 7,000 animals in these studies were induced despair, anxiety, psychological devastation, and death. Yeah, and we started off this episode by saying that, you know, that science has made real progress with certain types of disease and that there is some really brilliant science out there that is really trying to make the world a better place, especially for human beings. The examples that Jack has just given is of where people are just doing experiments, what, what looks like literally just to see what's going to happen. You don't need to perform sense deprivation experiments on primates to know what's going to happen. It's going to be pretty horrible. And even if, on the biggest if with a capital I and a capital F you were, you wouldn't need to do it on the numbers that Jack's mentioned there. That, and even if, like, even on a pure emotional level, even if those experiments don't disturb you in some way, in which case I'd say, you know, I, I, find, I find them personally quite disturbing, even just the financial cost, sensory deprivation cost if from the U.S. taxpayer $58 million. So you're, when you're paying your tax money in the U.S., you are paying for the government to do this. And for the results of what? To know that, did you know that if, uh, if you don't have any sensory experience, you kind of go a bit crazy and kill yourself or your children? I'm pretty sure most scientists could have figured that out without having to have these thousands of monkeys go through this horrible ordeal. Mm. Um, and, and this is an example, I think, of where I, I, I would even say there'd be some very angry scientists about this because this is not science. This is not doing it for the right reasons. These are a couple of, well, they would say some bad actors. And so many of them in the actual research articles, as you would imagine from research article, cite loads of examples of similar studies happening in the past. And they all conclude with a more research is needed within this area. Mm -hmm. So they look at the old literature and think they'll do it with a minor difference. Oh, it hasn't been done on this animal yet. As reviewers and trustees who award grants well know, you can make a very good case for getting a grant in a certain area, making it sound convincing, making it sound urgent. And I mean, the research has been done before, but it needs to be done on this specific animal and the, the cycle continues. And I think Singer as well in the book really well explains that these are not just a couple of odd experiments. There's an entire industry behind ex animal experimentation. It's not like, oh, there was one really bad guy and he harmed thousands of monkeys and then, you know, he's gone now and it's all fine. That there is almost a self-perpetuating profit that can be made from. He talks about these catalogs, doesn't he, where you can have a certain type of mouse mm. or a certain type of monkey or a certain type of thing. It's almost like this kind of idea of like a systemic problem where it perpetuates its own issue that maybe not every single animal a big quotation marks here, is being used for the correct purposes of a true scientific knowledge, but it's just for money and profit. They're, they're listed and charged for under the subheading of equipment, right? Mm. And that's the point Singer makes throughout. And it, all these sources are quoted from the articles they publish themselves or from the catalogues themselves. So it's not using the like the opposing view to, to make sure that he's giving an honest account. And just to take one from the whole rat catalogue, 140 pages of it, it like describes... The transparent plastic rabbit restraints, for instance, it tells us that, quote, the only thing that wiggles is the nose. Like it's in this cheerful marketing uh, language. It fails to reflect like what the actual rabbit's going to be going through during those eye tests, for example. I don't want to give too many numbers, but I just wanted to reiterate what Ollie said there about the, the scale of it. We've got some data here from 2020. So it's about 100 million animals plus uh, are used in experiments across the globe every year. In the European Union, we have 9.4 million animals being used in America. We have 20 million. Uh, China, 16 million. So we, we can see the scope of, of what's happening here. Um, and the, the um, while we've also used examples there of, of monkeys, and you mentioned rabbits there, but mice and rats are overwhelmingly the, the biggest numbers being used there for experiments. Yeah, I think a good way in often, and we haven't done this a lot so far, is to, as we see commonly in discourse around animal rights, is to simply make the comparison between one's domesticated dog or cat and the animals using the experiments. Because mm. like a, a pig is going to be roughly as intelligent as your domestic dog. So one that might hit home a little bit for people is the experiment in the 1950s at Harvard, in which they placed 40 dogs into a device called the shuttle box. And this is like a, a big system in which there's 
uh, one box little pen for each dog and there's a little fence splitting the box in half around the dog side so it can jump into the other half. So they electrocute the floor and the dog jumps over the fence to safety on the, at the other side. And once they've done this, they then electrocute the other side of the box and the dog jumps back and forth around a hundred times being electrocuted. Afterwards, they put a piece of glass in front of the dog. So the dog tries to escape the electric shock and then tries to escape at the front as well and keeps banging its head. They do about 12 weeks of trials doing this, hugging dogs up to these electric shocks. And the goal of which is to see at what point the dogs are going to break. Can they learn helplessness? Ten years later, Martin Selingman does the same experiment again. But instead, he doesn't bother with this complicated system. He just straps the dogs down to the electric shock and just shocks them until they give up. Like, will dogs give up if you shock them enough? Look at the study 10 years ago. I think when, when it comes to particularly the examining behaviors, they seem so much harder to justify if you could even justify them at all. I have this curiosity and I just want to see uh, if my intuition is in fact paid off by doing some sort of scientific experiment. One other experiment I wanted to bring up here uh, because it links into uh, medical science, I think this is quite a good one to reflect on using these animals without absolute certainty and, and where sometimes it can just go wrong. So a really famous case is that of the uh, drug thomilipide that was used as a anti-nausea agent for pregnant women from the 1950s and i don't know exactly when it stopped being used but a couple of decades afterwards and it had been tested on dogs and cats and rats and monkeys and hamsters and chickens and it produced no undesirable effects once it's then being used for pregnant women they begin to notice that actually there's lots of deformities with the babies that are, are born from these women who had been taking this drug. And so the statistics have it about 10,000 newborn babies were born with deformities, uh, which resulted in thousands of them dying as well. So that's an example there where you, you do all of the process right, looks like you're on to a winner. And yet it can still not work. And on the flip side of that, you can also look at things like with testing of what we now take for granted, things like aspirin, which are perfectly OK for us to use. But if they're tested on animals, have very uh, adverse effects there. So and it's just that kind of and, and I guess the argument there is you could have tested aspirin on human beings without the need for animals. But everybody wants to have those uh, special checks before you do it on a human being even if yeah. we don't have any reason to believe that, that would actually be useful when we apply some of the moral philosophy again the point of this for singer in the context of his book is if you aren't prepared to inflict the suffering on one creature why does it make it morally permissible to inflict the suffering on another creature yeah and i think a very mainstream view amongst certainly a lot of the students i teach about animal ethics is they're like oh no no no, i'm not for animal testing for torturing dogs and electrocuting them or irradiating monkeys no way like just surely an understanding of what's going on you'll be like no but they will say ah for certain medical things that's where i'm pro animal testing because mm. i can feel like that has a direct result that's working towards and this i think is when the conversation gets a bit more nuanced and a bit more interesting because when you start researching this stuff you, you, you do come across a bit of a barrier here which is that actually a lot of the animal testing like andy's just said with the example of the flamidahide is that when it get, goes to the transition from animals to humans there's a very high failure rate and actually very unforeseen circumstances, mm. again, like the, the mutating fetuses there. And that this is a very difficult thing to, to get your head around. You know, some people say, there's a quote here from the Peter website, which I found, which is that such animal experiments belittle the complexity of the human condition. There are so many things that make a human what it is, whether it's genetics, socioeconomic factors, you know, it's deeply rooted psychology of, of a human being compared to an animal that if you are performing certain experiments on an animal when you transfer it onto a human it could in mo and it does in most cases not work um, and there's so many other things you have to take into consideration that it does get much more complex i'd quite like to bring in some of the theory here that we've been looking at and apply uh, to not necessarily specific cases but just to the the principles at hand and so one of the things that christine Korsgaard mentions with this makes the distinction between prolonging life and saving a life so if somebody says well it's all worth it because it saves lives mm. actually I mean, it might sound like semantics but somebody might want to say well actually what's happening here is you're not technically saving a life you're prolonging a life for maybe 
10 extra years which mm-hmm. of course mm-hmm. like i i get i really don't want to belittle that i know that means everything to to, to some people but you, it does raise the question of how how long can a life be prolonged for and how many animals can we sacrifice for say three years of mm. human life for instance it's a very difficult question to answer and it becomes a lot more blurry than just simply saying i saved a human life because that feels like indefinite but of course that's just not how a lot of these things happen so let's say for instance with diabetes is that you could get that so the insulin treats the diabetes but it doesn't necessarily cure it depending on the type of diabetes that you have and so you might be tr- like be having to have this treatment for forever and it might prolong your life for a decent a very long period of time mm-hmm. but of course that's the point is it, how how much time is enough time to say that that okay ah, we've crossed the threshold and now we definitely know that that's okay so what i really like about singer's book is he doesn't mess around with the fringe cases. He simply says, look, an overwhelming majority of these just aren't needed. We've done the research before. It's gratuitous suffering. And he cites lots of great examples of people within the industry thinking the same thing themselves. And one example comes from Harry Harlow from isolating monkeys and torturing them fame. (laughs) And... He was the, a reviewer for a Journal of Comparative and Physiological Research for 12 years and reviewed 2,500 manuscripts on animal testing. And, quote, he said, most experiments are not worth doing and not worth publishing. So straight from the monkey torturer's mouth there. Now, <laughs> no value judgments here, guys. <laughs> Purely objective. <laughs> well, I think it's an objective. He did torture monkeys for psychological research i just want to give one the mad scientist thing one which i thought was horrific the last example i'm going to give on animal okay, testing okay. Uh, robert white's experiments in cleveland did you come across this one hmm. in which he transplants the heads of monkeys and keeps their heads alive in fluid after they've been detached from their bodies for as long as he can like that's something from a, a science fiction novel like a a dystopian sci-fi novel right we don't want to say as we keep saying throughout the series all scientists keep monkeys heads in vats because that's (laughs) what scientists do but there is a but it seems from the text that we've read that the justification from these scientists who do the experiments we've spoken about during this installment so far is a type of absolutist attitude that we described at the start of part one of the series. Of an interesting anecdote I came across was Robert Nozick, the famous political philosophy on a philosopher on a television show. He asked if there was a limit, as Andrew just said, to the scientists of how many animals one could kill in the name of science. Mm. And one of the scientists answered, not that I know of. And Nozick said, don't they matter at all? And they said, why should they? Well, I think this is really interesting as well, because it highlights what Singer mentioned earlier in Animal Liberation, which is this consistency. So it may be that when Robert Nozick talks to a scientist and, and with a microphone and goes, how many animals are you willing to sacrifice for science? And the scientist goes, as many as possible for mm. the true meaning of science. But that scientist may have a dog. Like that person may have other interactions with other animals which aren't in line with that I'd sacrifice everything for science opinion. That if the that it's the speciesism, right? It's this idea that we we show priority to human experience and like Andy mentioned earlier with the with the diabetes example, to extend life at any point. Like some some science isn't just about quote unquote saving, it's about extending. And I think that some people who would say, you know, I'd I'd sacrifice as many animals as possible for quote unquote science, I think there's a bit of a bit of a misunderstanding of what that actually means. But I think a lot of people upon reflection would say, okay, to a point, but then there might be a certain point where it's too much. You raise a really good point, which we've been kind of alluding to in terms of like what's tethered to the creatures, what matters to the creatures, what's meaningful. You raise the point that, yeah, science is a human based like desire, like an interest that humans have not shared by the animals. It's very much in our interests. Mm. So the pursuits of science and scientific discoveries shouldn't be free of moral considerations is the, the point being made. But even then, even if you thought that it wasn't just for the pursuit of knowledge, if you thought there were practical benefits to a lot of the experiments and even how small or big, we typically think there are moral limits to what we can do to other creatures in pursuit of like profit, for example, when we get into farming, like forced prostitution or pornography or slavery where there are clear limits to what suffering we can inflict on creatures for some other quote-unquote greater benefit we've just had quite a extensive look at some of the mistreatment of animals and i think because of the lack of time that we have we've perhaps 
you might get the impression that like oh all of these scientists who work with animals are somehow like intent on causing them suffering which i think is a bit of an unfair uh, overgeneralization i know that there has been a, a quite a big push within the scientific community at least in, in areas of it to try to reduce the amount of animals that are being used mm. there are cost benefit analyses is that are done where they they look to see where they can minimize the suffering of course somebody let's say with the with the deontological position there would be no justification at all for using the animals but and this is data from the rspca on the use of animal testing in 2020 and they're saying that 52 percent of of the animals experienced mild suffering 28 percent sorry 52 percent mild 28 percent moderate and only four percent severe for some people that might be the cost benefit there might be just about enough and while i unfortunately can't remember the name of the scientist because i'd i'd watched it in a documentary uh, a couple of years back so i apologize for this but he, but he was making a big point about saying that he was working on being able to develop the, a, a way of doing a lot of what requires animal testing to do on individual cells and so mm -hmm. there is there is a there is a community are working on on a way that will eventually eradicate the use of animal uh, uh, in testing and so people are working on this in, in, let's hope that in the years to come this will be something that people will look back on and say that's a horrible thing that we did to animals but that will be something that will not continue long into the future and it is worth saying that Peter Singer himself does approve of animal testing in some circumstances. So there was a documentary made on the BBC in 2006 called Monkeys, Rats and Me, Animal Testing, in which Peter Singer has discussions with Dr. Tipu Aziz, who is a neurosurgeon who specialises in Parkinson's disease. And according to Dr. Aziz, he says that they had to experiment on about 100 monkeys um, and give them a, a Parkinsonism or a type of Parkinson's. But up to date, that research had led to about the savior of the lives of about 40,000 people. And then when he presents that information to Singer, Singer responds with the following. I do not think you should reproach yourself for doing it, provided that there was no other way of discovering this knowledge. I could see this as a justifiable research. So if we're talking numbers, 100 monkeys, 40,000 people, Singer thinks that's justified. Mm. And I think that's actually good in terms of what Andy's talking about. Like We're not talking about here like all scientists are going around crazy torturing monkeys. Not at all, actually. As Singer's saying in the right conditions, in the right circumstance, if there's no other way you can do it and it's justifiable, then absolutely you can. Mm. And great things can happen from it. I worry that pointing to the benefits in some cases, it's not folk, it's a distraction from the real issue. The things that consumers, people listening to this show will be buying are cosmetic shampoos, food mm. colouring, inessential items. And Singer asks us, should thousands of animals suffer so you can have a new lipstick or floor wax? Do you not have enough lipsticks and floor waxes? Everyone, we're done with getting lipsticks and floor waxes. We've got plenty of them. He says, that's not benefiting you. It's just benefiting the business that keeps making them. The question she ask is, is it necessary? No, well, it's unnecessary. I agree. And I think most people would agree too. I think, yeah, it depends on the angle you come at this from. If you're coming from it from the angle of, I want to buy whatever makeup I want and have whatever shampoo and inject as many vaccines into my veins that have been tested on animals mm. because I'm just a human being. Yes, sure. I, I appreciate your point. But I would say, I think in, in 2021, there's quite a strong sense that most people, quote unquote, that's such a rubbish term, but I'm going to use it anyway, would say that animal testing for cosmetic purposes is wrong only in the case of something that's going to help preserve life or make a medical difference. Mm. I think that's quite a mainstream view. That's not a fringe view. Mo most people, most people who are concerned and like animals and concerned about ethically the product produce they buy will, will hold that stance. Mm. And I think and I think that that's fair. A final point on this then is the question of not don't want to go into this in too much depth but responses because a lot of the experiments that take place aren't just in some weird industrial estate but something which a lot of people listening to the show will be familiar with the university where does research take place and this blew my like it was a real light bulb moment when i was reading this book i was like wait no it's the things which i regularly go to even here at the university of liverpool like i just didn't think because they obviously destroy and euthanize the bodies to, uh, obviously so they don't get like animal liberators turning up and and protesting them but some information oxford carried out 225,000 edinburgh 200,000 birmingham 50,000 liverpool 25,000 just the individual institutions the uni ofs there 
uh, in just a single year. Uh, so they conduct millions of experiments on them. Lots of them do contain what Andrew described earlier as the severe suffering or the extreme suffering. Uh, lots of them, I think it's five or 6,000 animals at Liverpool, for example, were euthanized without being used last year. And you should there should be a high bar in which one says, and I think the ex- animal expectation one, like you say, is such a clear one hmm. that actually I think for a rare time, the overwhelming majority of people actually agree on a moral issue is that it should only be used when it's really, really necessary. Mm. So we can all finally agree that when it's unnecessary, then perhaps we shouldn't be using it. But Andrew mentioned earlier, like the three R's, replacement, reduction, refinement, and how research institutions are committed to reducing them. So rather than having vivisections for veterinarians, they'd show a training video, or have a mm. model. Like, do you need the live education in a multimedia age today? Is it necessary to inflict the suffering there and then? But universities aren't doing this. Take the University of Liverpool website where they say we promise to vigorously pursue the reduction, the replacement and refinement of this technology so we reduce the number of animals we're using. That hasn't happened. They just use the same amount. They increase more than anything. But the debate's won, right? They say, yes, we agree. We will reduce. And then it's the point to say, you're not reducing. So I wonder how morally responsible is one who's a part of an institution who doesn't point it out to me. It's an email, right? You're not doing it. Me and my mother went to the same school, obviously not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird. Wow. <laughs> but Why uh, haven't we talked about that? <laughs> Sorry, wait. <laughs> same secondary school. Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> when my mother was there during one of her biology lessons, she dissected a frog. So a frog that was killed for the pure purpose of being dissected, mm. which she had to dissect. And she, she didn't really like it. Lots of other members of the class didn't like it. When I was at the exact same school, many years later, I didn't have to dissect a frog. But we did have to dissect a heart, like a, I can't remember what from animal, it was a small heart, so it must have been from something. And I can imagine that today that is not happening. Mm. Why is that? Like, it's clear that that got there somehow, right? So that that frog or that heart is there from a, a dead animal. Now, with the university doing research, it's very much behind closed doors. And that unless there's like the papers which have the results of the research on it, they're not going to be recording it. And this reminds me a lot of what we, when we spoke to Daniel Dennett, he talked about the increasing transparency of institutions, mm. where actually institutions are much more accountable now for what they do behind yeah. closed doors, that with digital spaces and the increased amount of knowing where money goes, etc, etc, et et data protection, freedom of, freedom of information acts and stuff like that, that actually, yeah, a lot of universities and, and lots of other institutions have to kind of behave themselves and be mm. fully aware of what they're doing and why. So yes, if a institution has a website where they say we are fully committed to reducing the amount of animal suffering in our institution and they are still going about business as usual, mm. this could be an example of that transparency coming back to bite them. And actually, yes, I would agree. I think that if an institution you feel is doing animal experimentation, which is not for just purposes, then yes, of course, you should you should protest and you should make that in, make it known to that institution that you, that you disapprove of that, mm. especially if that institution is funded by taxpayer money, which you pay, <laughs> because then it has a very difficult, if it's a private business just doing crazy stuff, that's very different to a mm. publicly funded institution. Taking it away from specific universities, I think that's quite a nice way of looking at the difference between doing something physically in front of you, like dissecting a frog, as opposed to research that happens behind closed doors. Interestingly, dissecting animals still does take place in Mm. high schools in the UK, but it's illegal for a high school student to perform anyone below undergraduate level, rather, is more properly stated can't inflict suffering onto a creature as part of a, a lesson. But as soon as you're an undergraduate, then it's allowed. So it's an interesting question as to why that, mm. that is a law. Uh, finally, just before we move on to farming, we have mentioned a few times this idea that animal testing helps find cures and so on. But there's we should be sceptical of this argument pre- being presented for a really simple philosophical point. And we'll use an analogy to, to make it. Ollie needs to get to the train station, and Ollie says to me, Can I have a lift to the train station, please, Jack? I'm going to be late for my train. And I say, Of course, I'll give you a lift, and Ollie gets to the train station. But if I said no, you'd still walk to the train station. Oh, no, now I've got to sit here forever. He might have got there faster. We might have hit traffic. The fact is, it's unknown as to what would have happened without the animal testing. But what is known is that the suffering is inflicted on the creatures. So often we're trading in future promises with animal testing. Oh, it could do this. It's, it, there's a chance it might do this. And that's an unknown. It should not be measured in the same way as a known 
way animal suffering is measured. So we should be careful about the, these types of arguments being put forward. We can get to the train station perhaps in a, in a different way. Yeah, interesting idea. Although I guess with urgency, that could be something that could counteract it. Mm. So with the COVID vaccine, yeah. I'm pretty sure that was tested on animals. I would be very surprised if all the different ones were. So if there is literally a virus like ravaging the world, surely, surely, surely alarm, ding, ding, ding. But surely there would be an incentive then to go, ah, okay, maybe some animals are needed here to get to the train faster because otherwise it's going to go and then no more trains come in. Mm. Like, otherwise we're going to be stuck at that station for a long time. Yeah, trains are often delayed in England, so maybe it's a bad example. It doesn't yeah, matter when you get there. It's yeah. not going to be there when you're there. The next big discussion is on factory farming, as we said at the start of the episode. Factory farming, we just define terms quickly here. You might come across the term intensive farming, which is the same thing, and you might hear of mega farms. It's all the same kind of thing with these big open uh, factory blocks and animals are intensively reared within these for food or for the products in which they produce, so dairy. So factory farming usually has a couple of major factors that come up no matter where they are in the world because it's the way that they really must function in order for them to operate the way that they do. So we're talking, as I already said, very intense farming, maximizing the the costs here by saving on costs presumably by having everything crammed into very tight spaces and mm. using less land, but also by producing them so quickly, they'll be able to maximize profit on that way. What else does that involve then? Well, as like for the animal's sake, because they're so tightly crammed in, there's going to be lots of poor conditions for them. The, one of the things that's very often brought up is the fact that chickens will only have about an A4 space of paper for them mm. to maneuver within the particular hangar that they find themselves in. Antibiotics must be used within the for these animals to be able to survive the conditions in which they're in. This has huge impacts on the spread of other viruses and stuff and uh, and things that superbugs that uh, are able to develop uh, beyond the uh, the capabilities of these antibiotics. The the fact that these animals are almost exclusively genetically modified mm. to be able to grow within the time space that mm. they want to do. So, for instance, chickens in I assume worldwide, but I'm speaking primarily in the UK because it's the thing that I know the best here is, is that the average life of a broiler chicken is 35 days before they are then slaughtered. For them to be able to grow big enough within the 35 days, they of course have to have been selectively bred so that they continue to grow at a much like, unnatural rate than they would otherwise mm. do. In 2016, you've got about 6 billion chickens being killed worldwide in factory farms and about 8 billion being used for eggs, mm. which is an insane amount of number. It's the second largest quantity of farmed animals in the world. We can talk about kind of battery cages and broiler sheds. So we have, so uh, you've got chicks hatch out of the eggs, right? And they're sexed. So within a day, you can tell whether it's going to be a male chick or it's going to be a lady chick. The male chick has no use pretty much. So what happens in the EU regulation law is they're thrown on a conveyor belt, which takes them along to a grinder and they're ground up into little bits. If it's a female chick, then obviously it's all about the 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 egg laying and egg hatching as well. Um, so, like Andy mentioned, you've got these idea of battery cages. So many chickens have their beaks uh, cut off completely, which we can imagine would be quite painful for the chicken. Not used uh, any antibiotics or anything like that at all. Not no any pain medication really. There. And then forced to stay in these cages either laying eggs for their whole life and, and pretty much being force fed it's it's kind of looked at from the literature too so it's, it looks like these chickens you know angie said the uh, andy said the average life of a chicken is what 35 days mm. that can and obviously if we're not looking we're looking at like meat or the meat on a chicken that can only happen through just insane amount of overfeeding and force feeding so these chickens balloon in just over a month mm. and then they're taken to slaughter and their lives are over and just a few things on things you and andrew have been saying that the normal lifespan is supposed to be at be about seven years and with the male chicks that are discarded because they've got no use and like you say some of them are gas some of them are crushed mm. but sometimes it's just cheaper for them to suffocate them in a bag mm. actually the second is more economical for them because they grind up the male chicks and they feed them to their sisters the hens mm. for the egg production they also have very dim lighting to reduce the pecking and so they don't hurt each other so they spend those few weeks that they do have in close to near if not total darkness with 80,000 other birds typically in a single shed and all the mo modern poultry farmer does is just get rid of the the dead ones uh, de-beak as, as you say and the de-beaking is really interesting because it's hard again 
the mental states of other animals, it becomes hard to access them here. Is is de-beaking like clipping one's nails? Is it like having a, a toe removed? What's it like? So I've just dug out a quote from a zoologist, uh, Rogers Brownwell here, and he says, between the horn and the bone is a thin layer of highly sensitive soft tissue. The hot knife used to, in de-beaking cuts through this complex horn bone and sensitive tissue causing severe pain. And he likens it to being amputated as a human being, having phantom pains and severe pains as you as you go on. So it's not like clipping your nails or something. It's actually a really mm. sensitive and vital part of the uh, the chicken's physiology. So a note on the male chicks there. We talk about free range eggs a lot and we can talk about what that means later on perhaps. But we should recognize that even if the chicken is free range, that the male chicks have almost certainly been uh, destroyed in the first early days of their lives in order to have that hen. And the conditions which we're describing in these batch hens are laying an incredible amount of eggs, way more than they would be doing out in the wild. A former president of the National Poultry Organization writes, we've discovered chickens literally grow faster in cages. It seems that the chickens' toes get caught in the wire mesh in some manner and sometimes won't loosen. So in time, the flesh of the toes goes completely around the wire. So it's very common for these birds literally to grow around the cages and again severe pain when they mm. move away from it we can talk about the actual killing process and all of those things but one point i think was worth raising in terms of the things we've discussed earlier in the episode is that these hens and chickens they can't walk around they can't scratch the ground they can't build nests they can't stretch their wings or be part of a flock so maybe we can say something on why that's important because a lot of people say well if they wouldn't know otherwise why would they want or how can how is that suffering yeah, so a lot of scientists and a lot of philosophers talk about this idea of species-specific behaviour. And I guess you could kind of connect this to the cause guard stuff we were talking about earlier with the idea of what does it mean to be a chicken? What does a chicken do? A chicken's not sitting around thinking about philosophy smoking a pipe, right? It's a, what is the goal of a chicken? And that has and its goal, or its you know, telos or whatever you could say, whatever word you want to use, is to do species-specific behaviour. What does a chicken want to do? Well, a chicken wants to walk around. A chicken wants to be normally outside. A chicken wants to peck the ground and explore and interact with other chickens and birds freely to be able to move around. Now, if you take a chicken and put it in a cage, then obviously you are severely limiting its behaviour to the point where what can it literally do? You've even taken its beak away. It can literally just sit there and go crazy mm. and probably scream and that's about it uh, as someone who's been to a, a free range egg farm myself there's one very close to where i grew up you know in a free range egg farm chickens have the opportunity to go outside they they walk around they cluck they you know peck the ground they they exhibit what it would be like to be obviously there's hundreds of them so it's not quote unquote natural environment you never have that many chickens together in one place but they interact with each other there's a there's a sense they have some form of control if they want to go outside if they want to go inside they can make choices and that that quality of life surely would be better than being stuck in a cage when they can't move for 30 days and then being murdered I'm starting to worry that chickens might have more interests than I do. For a second there. <laughs> There's quite a long list of things they want to do. I don't <laughs> mean to be a chicken. Just, and as Ollie's described there with the with that say free range or an organic farm, is that for some people they might feel as if and, and this might just be because either they're unaware of certain things or maybe the price is a, a big factor in this. But out of all the in so roughly speaking and it does vary month to month but in the uk 80 million chickens are killed for food every month hmm. so that's a an incredibly large number of animals being killed now if that's the case then you might want to wonder well how many of those are your organic or free range and according to the data anywhere between three to one percent uh, of of the birds that are being sold in in supermarkets are those, which means that the vast majority of people, if we're just assuming based on the like what what's being sold here, is this intensively reared mm. animal. And uh, just on that point about price, well, the uh, chickens that are sold in the major supermarkets within the UK, if you're selling them the animals from intensive farms, it's going to cost it's going to cost the customer anywhere between. Like one pound ninety nine to uh, two pounds seventy three per kilogram for a roasting chicken. Mm. But if you wanted to buy something that was organic, then you're going to be somewhere between six pounds and seven pounds. And so the the cost is is there. And one of the things that I kept coming across when I was doing my research for this was just this point on if you want to do farming in a way that we might dare call humane, mm. is that a lot of people are priced out of 
buying the meat mm-hmm. right. and so it's like basically you like can you afford to eat meat and maybe you, it should be then if you can't afford it maybe you, you you have it for special occasions but if you want it just every day then the cost is what we've been describing mm-hmm. and if you're not okay with that then you have to ask that question of like, am i okay just kind of just saying for my own convenience i'm i'm happy to have all this extra cost that i don't actually see myself and don't have a hand in just so i save a bit of money from my own pocket was that one to one two three percent like what in between one and three percent is not yeah so, free range so chicken. Th- uh, yeah three percent is organic chicken and right. i believe uh, uh, organic, three 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 percent is free range one percent right. is organic so organic just means it's not given the hormone injections and the yes the, but by the almost by definition organic. if you're an organic chicken you are not intensively reared yeah. because the intensively okay. reared ones have all of right. that stuff yes three yeah. percent that's really interesting and within that three percent still we can still have the de-beaking we can still have the a rough treatment of them on the way to slaughter. We have mm-hmm. them hooked up to the conveyor belt and that their throats slit on the, um, and yeah. they can be killed consciously as well. Even within that 3%, there are problems. In, in addition to the not being able to exhibit those other features to go as far as the farm or let them. I wonder, because it's very common, you, you hear this response, isn't it? That, no, that's not the kind of meat that I buy, or it's fine to buy this meat. But that, that stat's quite shocking that it's, that it's such a small percentage because all that meat we find in smaller products, uh, like pies. I'm trying to think what people buy, like chicken pie, chicken soup. Yeah, well, there's, and, and there's, 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 there's so many processed meats because yeah, all of the, the slices and stuff that people might have in right. sandwiches. But there's, in the frozen section in any supermarket, there's all sorts of chicken Genius. nuggets and chicken goujons and whatever it might be. Different different forms of shapes of things mm. that have, have been uh, manufactured mm. for our consumption mm-hmm. one last thing i wanted to point on this as well is is that actually the more and this is completely understanding economically speaking is that the more that people buy from the factory farms unsurprisingly is that all of these other smaller farms will begin to lose out mm-hmm. and the as the the data suggests here that between 2010 and t- 2016 and this is in the uk again about four thousand farms closed and these are smaller farms that might be able to produce things that people might be more happy consuming but we're watching that slowly fade away in this country mm. to the point where you won't be left with anything other than something that is morally compromising. Yeah, the book and documentary Eating Animals in 2018 talks about this idea that some farms that are, you know, quote unquote, the good farms, the farmers that are actually trying to kind of preserve traditional farming methods that actually are do not treat their animals in a horrific way or lock them in cages, give them the opportunity to be outside exploring, etc. They're actually being put in competition with each other and actually being almost forced to use factory farming methods and being put in direct competition with factory farms. And even if you look at it just from a purely economical point of view, it's quote unquote less efficient. So it's it can't compete. Mm. And you're just seeing the vast, vast reduction of those what we would say traditionally, you know, good, better farmed meat to, you know, a, a small collection of factory farms that are owned by big businesses that are all about maximizing profit and creating things as efficiently as possible. Mm. And that's the the circumstances we've explained, right? It's horrible to talk about these chickens in these conditions, but for the for the companies that run these massive factory farms, it's just about efficiency. Next to chickens and cows, pigs being one of the most popular domesticated animals that are raised and killed in the in the West or in the world for, for their flesh. Quote, of all the animals commonly eaten, the pig is without doubt the most intelligent. The natural intelligence of a pig is comparable and perhaps even superior to that of a dog and taking that from singles animal liberation there. We mentioned the DB king of the chickens and the hens and no different for pigs. They cut their tails off, often with the same instrument that they use for de-beaking uh, chickens. We, I didn't mention before, but it started off with like a blowtorch that would do it with chickens, and then it became this hot like guillotine-like thing, and now they use that same thing for the pigs' tails. And As one pig producer writes, they hate it. The pigs just hate it. And I suppose we could probably do without tail docking if we gave them more room. And secondly, we don't get paid for producing animals with good posture around here. We get paid by the pound. The reason why the pigs have their tails docked is because they're in these confined conditions and end up biting off each other's tails. And so they just take them off nice and early. 
So pigs are normally kept in windowless sheds, barely able to uh, stand even uh, and express species-specific behaviour, like the chickens, often incredibly overfed as well, so they swell quickly. You've heard the phrase, greedy as a pig, before, I'm sure, and pigs, if you just give them food, kind of just don't stop eating. They actually gain weight really, really quickly, which can mean they often get too big for their own age. So like the chicken, they can get almost like so, so big that they can't even stand up. EU regulation says that they have to have some form of, quote, enrichment in pig pens now. But that's a really vague term in what that means. So it could be that you come across a packet of some pork chops and it's got like, you know, made in the UK, made in the EU with enriched happy pigs. And it's got a big UK flag on it or a picture of a tractor. Uh, David Clough says that what he experienced was this was literally just a piece of wood on a chain put in the middle of the pen that the oh. pigs would sometimes like poke and nibble instead of nibbling each other's tails mm. hence why they cut them off is so they don't bite each other's tails because they go crazy in such small confined spaces pigs pigs species specific behavior mm. is to make nests to wallow to walk around to interact with each other they're social creatures so forcing them in small environments causes them a great amount of distress i think it's worth saying as well from people that i know that have actually been to pig slaughterhouses Pigs scream and pigs like human beings get quite stressed mm. and they can smell stress and it, and sense it kind of like human beings can. And that apparently pig, pig slaughterhouses are one of the worst places to work or be in just for that pure amount of that stress and squealing mm. is almost and well, it's, loads it's of horrific. workers are um, uh, injured and they have one of the highest turnovers, don't they? In, in staff, interesting what you mentioned about the, the their natural behavior, like the sows will move away from the group to have their children and come back they exhibit some high level behavior but obviously they can't do that in the environments in which they're raised and the sows are literally just used to make piglets and they take them away and over and again and that's uh, highly distressing for them and those that often cite cows reason for not having um, beef reasons for not having uh, milk and cheese and dairy products often say because they don't want them separated but the same is is true of the pigs one really interesting thing which i found during the research was we have quote-unquote humane laws surrounding the killing of the animals to make sure they're not conscious during the the actual slaughter I found some work from Dr. Harold Hillman, and he says, it seems really obvious when you actually read it, right? He's like, why do we think electrocuting or stunning the pigs is making them unconscious? We know that in the electric chair, the person who being electrocuted isn't unconscious. So when the animal is stunned, they most likely do experience the suffering. And there's lots of accounts from the managers of these slaughterhouses. You get like a blood splat or a, a, like blood flies when you electrocute them too harshly and sometimes they can react to it really negatively and injure the staff so they often turn them down so as to not have these unwanted consequences so that a lot of the time they do go in there conscious but you were mentioning a moment ago that species specific needs and that piece of wood is a luxury right if you're looking at the yeah. five basic freedoms of animals they want them to be able to quote turn around to groom to get up lie down and stretch their limbs that's what animal rights activists are fighting for is five like they really are basic aren't they sit down stand up <laughs> turn around <laughs> but uh, a piece of wood dangling from the top i mean that it's sounds like a, a high life a party. as opposed to going outside <laughs> crikey let's slow down i think it's also worth saying as well pigs especially compared to lots of other cattle create a lot of waste Ooh. as well because they're eating so much uh, that can lead to a very different type of problem which is regarding the amount of manure that they produce yeah in um philip limebury's farmageddon the true cost of cheap meat he he talks about particularly focuses on france and Brittany, where they produce 14 million pigs a year it's a huge industry out there but he opens that chapter talking about there's like this toxic algae that was uh, in the in the water I, mean, I don't know exactly where it was placed but some somebody was on a horse and they fall into it and they're trying to like and instantly the horse is struggling and then the horse suffocates and oh. dies and then he but as he's trying to he, but he's stuck in it too so somebody else has to jump in and they cut and they're stuck in it and then somebody else jumps in like it's, it's like this i know it sounds absolutely mad but like a number of people die by being, like wow. getting stuck in this toxic gas and and that's and what they realize afterwards is that it become toxic because of all the waste that it mm. bit, like had mm. contaminated the water and that the horse had had just suffocated within the 
the sulfur, uh, the, the hydrogen sulfide, sorry, that was being released in there. So that drew a lot of attention to the problem that was happening. And as Ollie suggested there, is that the amount of waste that is being produced by the, the pigs is is so bad that it cannot help but contaminate either the air that it surrounds the area. So in, and I know this is like the least of anyone's concern is that the people like living in the surrounding area have to put up with the fact that their houses and, and their livelihoods are completely contaminated by this in the air, but also all of the water that then goes into the rest of the wildlife around the, the, the farms is affected, uh, not to mention the fact that it has severe effects on human life as well. Yeah, David Clough mentions this idea of environmental racism, which I'd never really heard about before he talked to us about it, but he said in North Carolina in America, in that state there are as many pigs as people. There are these huge, massive, intensive pig farms that create an obscene amount of waste and they literally don't know what to do with it. So mm. they buy the land around the factory farm and then spray the waste into the air as a way to get rid of it. But what that means is that the surrounding areas around those factory farms, it just means that they are toxified, toxicity, you know, the, the land is contaminated and it stinks. And the people that live nearby these factory farms are normally the families that work there. And these are overwhelmingly you know, they're either indigenous Native American or people of color. These these people's children get bullied at school because they smell like pig feces. And you've got this whole structure of, you know, exploitation, which goes far, far deeper than just the animal itself, which is horrific. The effect on the environment and the effect even on people then, I think is something worth considering. You know, even being a slaughterhouse worker, we mentioned it briefly, mm. you know, I, I can only imagine... The, the type of experience that must be, mm -hmm. you know, having to meet really harsh quotas, very poor working conditions, high case of injury, the, the even just the idea that they're mainly done by minority groups, women and migrants. You know, there's 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 lots going on here. Like this system of exploitation goes very, very deep. We're nearly done with all the horrific stuff. And thank you for listening into this point of the episode. We really didn't want to skip over and we're having to skip over so much of it, obviously. With that said, we can't finish talking about farming without talking about cows as one of the most popular domestic animals as well. I'll be very brief here. Here's a lot of the you know, the experience of a cow is quite different to, to the pig or the chicken in the factory farm. The producers ensure that the cows become pregnant every year in order to keep them in milk and their offsprings are then taken off them straight afterwards. And that's obviously very painful for the mothers who go through that experience and the calves as well, of course. Uh, the veal um, often made is what killed within a couple of days and we could do a whole episode on the veal industry and how that developed but needless to say uh the veal industry is is google it <laughs> no don't don't i suppose sorry, don't, I say, okay just we're, i'm not going to tell you how to live your life all the time but just don't eat the veal and we're not going to tell you about that one i felt there's very there's very few veal enthusiasts <laughs> to, to the show well hopefully not anyway uh so as the first car's taken away they begin the cycle again they impregnate them again and that intense cycle of being pregnant having the calves taken away is about five years the cows milk like three times a day and after five years the cow uh, will die from that intense cycle turned into dog food or a hamburger or something like that and of the 34 million cattle slaughtered in 1987 alone in the u.s that is so 34 million a year in the u.s 70 percent went that went for slaughter were from feedlots the feedlots they've got a lot more room than pigs and chickens but a part of that species specific need is that it's just the barren boring unchanging environment which they suffer through they're not able to express then their tethered goods and, and be able to have those instrumental goods and Nearly all these beef producers, they dehorn, they brown, they castrate the animals, a knife to the back of the scrotum, and they literally yank out the testicles of these animals, and that's excruciatingly painful for them, obviously. 90, oh, it's in the 90% and above in, in the UK, isn't it, for the, the meat and dairy that's produced is from these factory farms. But even in the family farming industry, you've still got dehorning and branding and castrating uh, you've got the separating from the mothers from the offspring you've got the transport the handling and we we haven't even talked about the actual slaughter in in any real depth here so and or even fish right we haven't even talked about the suffocating of fish which is probably is it just as big or even bigger than something there's trillions of fish killed so year, aren't there? the data i have is that worldwide every year you've got 70 billion land creatures that are killed 
and seven trillion sea animals that are killed for food each year. Yeah. So seven you, trillion uh, fish or fish-like animals are yeah are killed for food every. I only year. want to make one point because I think we've made our general point. That sometimes the argument say I'm pescatarian because fish are unlikely to to feel pain in comparison to these these mammals on land. That they've got complex nervous systems. A lot of fish, popular consensus, they can feel as much pain as. As, as dogs and pigs etc and certainly more than chickens a lot of uh, larger uh, creatures in the sea but the idea that they wouldn't feel as much pain because they've got different senses that comes up a little bit doesn't it but the the strip down a fish's side has to detect the even smallest change in the water a dog sense of smell and, and a pig sense of smell those those senses are going to be different depending on the species mm. so it's not clear to for you to say that or they don't suffer because they're they've got different senses. In fact, some of them might suffer more in different ways uh, because of the fine tuneness of the their sensory uh, faculties. I just wanted to finish off on this particular point of saying that. Well, I know it seems silly. I was uh, what I'm about to say is that I, I don't think we've actually done this enough <laughs> like justice. <laughs> as in the like, like the scale of what's happening here is so. Like penetrating into all sorts of areas of 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 life that you may just not know about and we haven't really talked about the economic stuff here uh, we haven't really even talked about much of the environmental uh, factors too but it seems to be that that at least the way in which factory farming is happening as it currently is is even if for some reason you listen through all of this <laughs> so far and say i still don't really care too much about the animals it's just that it is unsustainable we cannot continue this if we want to live on a planet for much more time yeah. than, than we already know we have i'm going to take what andy's taken and give it some data so there's a really good book called harvesting the biosphere uh, which was published in 2015 by Vaclav Smil. So I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. And there's, a, there's, if you just Google his name, there's some nice free to access information that you can see about his research into factory farming. Bearing in mind, factory farming had, didn't really start properly until just after World War II. So mm -hmm. we think of the 1940s. So we've only really had about, what, 60, 80 years of factory farming maximum on a big scale. So you, just a couple of pieces of information coming away. This is more about the environmental impact of factory farming. So by 1900, we had so far expanded domestic animals that their combined mass outweighed the combined land mass of all wild animals on the planet by three and a half times. So that's before factory farming. So there's three and a half times more farmed animals than wild animals. By the year 2000, we'd quadrupled the biomass of domesticated animals. And that was one of the main factors in the amount of wild animals being halved. Mm. By 2000, the combined biomass of all domestic animals was 24 times more than all wild land mammals. Domesticated chickens alone make up three times more than all of the wild birds on the planet at all today. And in that 100 years between 1900 and the year 2000, we reduced the amount of wild fish in the ocean by 90%. And he, in this in his book, argues that factory farming is a form of mass extinction that is in line with historic events like asteroids and famines. Mm. That if we continue to factory farm at the level and rate which we are, and if you look at especially the rise of places like China uh, and India, it only looks like factory farming is going to increase instead of decrease into the future, that we are going to get to a point within the next century or two where wild animals are going to be things you learn about in textbooks and they are not things you are going to see. And I think that that environmental impact is not just down to factory farming, but a massive part of it. An incredibly large amount of harm is done to the environment through factory farming. And that as soon as you learn that, looking at the kind of philosophy of it, per mm. se, then I think that a lot of philosophers are going to say that there's, or you know, people who are conscientious about you know having more than two or three generations left, that uh, we need to do something about it. What I like about these two examples is that the factory farming and the unnecessary animal testing, they're not too controversial, are they? Well, at least I, I certainly don't think they are when we actually look at the, the bones of them. Why it still continues to happen... Well, it's a mystery. Oh, it's not really a mystery, but oh, I need a segue. <laughs> the Mystery Philosopher. Welcome to your final Mystery Philosopher. Ooh. Ooh. Is it 2 nil to Andrew so far? Andy or one is in the lead, Andrew? as always. One? Is it just 1 nil to Andrew? I can't remember from no, last I got, week. I got them both wrong. Both wrong? Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you fancy your look this time around? Sure. <laughs> 
Oh, I know so, what that is. Yeah, that's that. Well, you take it. Oh, I think Ollie's that a first. It's Jack. a woodpecker. Well done. Very. Have you, good. have you seen that video on Twitter of that woodpecker like hammering that tree? And it's like this is my vibe right now. And he's like carved a hole so deep that he's nearly gone all the way through it. <laughs> I like no. that. I like that. That's a good video. Do you know why they uh, tap on the trees? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, nests to build a nest. Sometimes to build a nest. Nice. And the other reason would be to... Um, cut down trees because I hate them. Like insects. Get oh, the insects okay. out. So, so nice. they tap on them and then you see the woodpecker put his ear to the tree. Or her. And then... The, the... <laughs> 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 and that's all we've got time for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. How could we like... Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. Excellent. That was great. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>